We now present to you a fireside chat with Mr. Krishna Kumar Natarajan on the theme "Leading with Purpose." We have with us Sophia David, who will take the session forward. Sophia is a TED speaker and an inclusion and diversity advocate. She was a U UN Women Speaker who represented India at the International Conference for Gender Equality. She works with one of the top four consulting firms in the world. She is a facilitator, a consultant, and a leader coach. With about 19 years of work experience, I request Sophia to please introduce Mr. Krishna Kumar Natarajan and take the session forward. Thank you. Over to you, Sophia. Thank you so very much. Welcome to NHRD and National Conference 2022. My name is Sophia David. My pronouns are she and her. I'm having the busiest week. That said, this one conversation is something that I was looking forward to. Okay, um, it sounds like a very existential question when I say. Have you asked yourself what is your purpose on the job that you're on or in life in general? Yes. Today, in this conversation, we'll provide you a couple of guardrails to help unpack the concept of leading with purpose. That's exactly what we're doing, and I'm so excited to sort of introduce you to our guest. Okay, our guest is Krishna Kumar Natarajan, who we fondly call KK. Um, he he co-founded MindTree in 1999, and has played key roles in building uh, the company's innovative approach to delivering IT services and solutions to global 2,000 enterprises. As executive chairman, he built a 1 billion revenue company with a market cap of over 2.5 billion. Krishna Kumar's efforts as a business leader has been recognized worldwide, winning him several laurels. Business World and Forbes. Ranked him among the most valuable CEOs in India in 2016. He won the Bloomberg UTV's award as the CEO of the year in 2010, Business Today CEO of the year award in 2014, and was recognized by Chief Executive Magazines as one of the 12 global leaders of tomorrow. His stint as head of HR in Wipro saw Wipro win many awards. For leading edge HR practices, social enterprises, and philanthropy, our other key interests of Krishna Kumar, and is currently the chairperson for the NASCOM Foundation. Everybody, please join me in rolling up your sleeves and giving a big round of applause to Krishna Kumar Natarajan. Thank you very much, KK. Thank you so very much for joining us for this conversation. Thank you. Sophia, thanks, thanks for the very generous introduction. In fact, I must again emphasize uh, when I led HR for the Wipro technology business, that was my best stint in Wipro. Out of the 19 years I spent there, the three and a half years in HR was probably the best time. I continue to sort of be engaged in seeing how to, in a way, share some of the experiences I've gained by that stint. Okay, we're gonna sort of peek your brain on some of those experiences. I want to quickly start with a rather very simple question right at the top. Okay, what does leading with purpose mean in layperson's terms? I think that's a very interesting question. Now, when I look at what leading with purpose means in layperson terms. One is the ability to inspire people. Now, yes, people have a certain sense of vision, but it's important to articulate that, which means inspiring others uh, is very important. The second element is really influencing them, not necessarily directing them, but influencing them to do things which will take them towards the team's goals. Uh, And the third element, which I think is extremely important, is how do you make people grow? And that's something which is very, very important. As leaders, I would think the fundamental responsibility is to make people below you grow, and inspire, influence, and making people grow, so that as a team we move towards the goals which he said is what. It means to me, in layperson's term, when you lead with purpose. Thank you so very much. Uh, leadership is considered an acquired skill. So, who is your role model 
when it comes to leading with purpose? And why would you say this person is your role model? See, again, at various stages, one has seen different people be role models. Um, but clearly, on leading with purpose, the person who probably has influenced me the most is Mr. Asim Premji. Okay. Having got out of business school and directly gone in as an intern into Wipro. And the organization was fairly small, so one had really the privilege of watching him function. And one of the key elements, I think what I talked about, inspiring people in terms of vision. I think Mr. Premji is not that way an articulate speaker, but I think his ability to inspire people, even though he may not be a very articulate speaker, is phenomenal. Okay. More than anything else, the simplicity of his thoughts and clarity of his thoughts. Uh, I think it's very clear that businesses and sustainable businesses can be built on the fundamental philosophy of unrelenting commitment to integrity. And simplifying that with very, I would say, clear statements in terms of saying, in business dealings, there's nothing which is gray. It's either black or white. So when a leader inspires you and gives you a simple framework of how do you see you can lead with purpose, uh, I think then you start imbibing some of those elements. Uh, and to that extent, I certainly think a lot of what I've learned and what we tried implementing at Mindtree were very much influenced by what we learned from Mr. Premji. So, I mean, if you look at, I mean, we're all HR professionals and society is full of leaders leading with purpose. Would you be able to share something that you learned about leading with purpose from a non-HR person, somebody outside the world of HR? No, I think, again, I must be honest, having been just in the tech business, a lot of my influences were with people within the technology industry. A person who I've certainly been uh, fortunate enough to have known and really learned from is Mr. Narayan Murthy. Yeah. Okay. I think okay. again, we believe that large sustainable businesses can only be built by people who have a background, who have a silver spoon. I think Mr. Murthy really, in a way, broke away some of those premises. Uh, I think the way in which he built Infosys uh, and taking a stance that transparency and governance uh, is probably some of the key elements in which organizations can get built and they live beyond founders because uh, that's a very important element of building organizations which can continue to thrive and survive even beyond the founders uh, and his simple premise like saying normal public listed companies when there is a bad news i think they don't uh, share with the market whereas his premise was uh, hey when there is a doubt just disclose uh, in God, we trust the rest. We will just trust data. Simple things which, in a way, drive you in terms of saying, yes, I think the concepts which can be understood by person at every level within the organization, we can still lead with purpose. And again, Mr. Murthy has never been in a formal HR role. Right. So now that you spoke about organizations and enforces as an organization, uh, here's a question for you. You are a market leader, right? Uh, how does your individual purpose tie to the organizational purpose of the firms that you led? See, I must be honest, I still think I have a long way to go, though this is my third innings, <laughs> Wipro, Mindtree, and then starting an early stage fund. Uh, but certainly, many times, I think the best results come when your individual purpose is tied with the organizational purpose. Uh, and 
many times i think you need to try and look at things where there is an alignment between that and just to give an example right now i am the chairperson of nascom foundation which is really the social arm of the industry body nascom so in a lot of way i think what i have as an individual purpose uh, influences some of the thinking of nascom foundation like we have clearly seen while technology is starting to play a very key role in all our lives uh, people below the poverty line while they don't have a, an ability to learn some of these elements uh, so one of the key initiatives in nascom foundation is to teach 3 million people below the poverty line digital skills which means they know how to handle a phone now if they want to access some of the benefits available to them they know how to learn it now, which comes from the inherent uh, i would say desire to say that how can i as an individual contribute to reducing the inequality the second big thrust in nascom foundation is can we get more rural girls into technology and give them job opportunities so the third element is can we use technology for social good so can we create jobs for physically challenged people by leveraging technology yeah so to that extent while the organizational purpose is sort of getting driven by these priorities my personal earning and my own personal purpose in a way has sort of got aligned and has influence articulating some of this purpose led initiatives so you know this is just an observation and this is something that i i felt a couple of months ago which is when you work without purpose you get the feeling that you're not being resourceful right would you be okay to share a story or an anecdote where you experienced this where you felt you were not resourceful because you were not clear about the purpose and you immediately course corrected and to get to your sense of purpose do you have an experience like that that you like to share no it is certainly a, a very uh, i think it happens and particularly it happens at times of crisis that you lose your sense of purpose uh, again i'd like to share an anecdote in the mindtree context uh, while i think a lot gets talked about the success of the company today because it's achieved something there were near what i call death calls for the company and there was particularly a time uh, 12 13 years back when the company was public and we made an apparently huge strategic mistake yeah. and markets being markets really punished us for that and uh, from where we went ipo the company came down to a value of 10% of the ipo value and at that time i certainly lost my sense of purpose uh, so the immediate thing was to say hey how do i correct this what do i do to do the market so for several months one was not resourceful in trying to solve short term crisis but then we regrouped as a management and said you know what irrespective of where we are i think our purpose is to build a company which will sustain and we need to do what is right for the customer so when for a period of time we said we will ignore the market we will do what is right we'll do what is right for the customer i think when we regain the purpose we started getting respect back to the extent within 2 years cnbc judged us as being the most promising company of 2013 now which is clearly a reflection when we lost sense of the purpose i think we were just uh, i would say moving around aimlessly okay but when we realized that and said our purpose is to serve our customers do what is right i think the recognition and the self confidence came back right thank you for that uh now here's a question there are about um uh, 149 hr professionals at the moment 
And I want to believe that they represent organizations from different scales, right? So my question is for startups, envisioning purpose is easy because um, they work as tiger teams and they just have one goal to chase and they're always in unison of sorts. But when you look at organizations which are scaling up into the hundreds and thousands, yes, it can be challenging to lead its people with a singular purpose, right? What is your take on purpose for organizations that are growing? No, that's again a very key question because again, being engaged in the startup ecosystem for the two, uh, for the last several years, but very actively in the last two years, uh, I find that a lot of organizations think about their culture and values uh, more as an addition once they've reached certain scale. Uh, to me, getting these right is a foundational aspect. Because one thing which we used to uh, often repeat in Mindtree is building a company is like building a temple. You have to build it brick by brick. It doesn't get created overnight. Uh, so it's important to articulate who are you as a person? What is, after all, organizations are persona. So who are you as a person? What is your DNA? Organizations get their vision right, saying, hey, we want to be the market leader in this and so on. But it's important to think about what are your values? Uh, how do you really go about achieving that vision without compromising on your values? Uh, and it's important to get the whole team aligned to that because it cannot be an add-on once you've become a certain size. Because by then, many people would have come in with a different context. They would come in with their own perspectives, so it's very difficult to integrate. Yeah. So to that extent, I certainly, many of the startups which we invest in and work, we really say building the core elements of the DNA, the values and culture is a foundational activity. And you need to think of it much ahead of the time when you scale. If you have scaled and then you start thinking of it, it's a far more difficult exercise. Absolutely. Now, here's a question. It might sound a little intrusive. And if you need to take a moment to answer this, that's completely fine. But let me ask you this, all right? Leaders have to take their people with them. But sometimes when they're too driven with their purpose, they are often labeled as self-indulgent. Okay. How can one avoid that brand? How can a leader inspire his, her, their people to embrace a common purpose. You, you quoted Azim Premji in the past, and I, I, I want to believe that he's one of those leaders who was able to take his people with them successfully without seeming self-indulgent. What is your take on that? See, I think the role of leadership is also, while communicating the vision and inspiring people, is to be very active listeners. Uh, and it is certainly feasible that some people in the team aren't inspired, aren't influenced by what you think should be the purpose. So it's the role of the leader to continue to work on them and in a way get them aligned to the organizational's purpose and goal. Uh, to me, I think many leaders try what I call a top-down approach of saying, hey, this is what it is and you need to buy into it. At the end of the day, people come with their perspectives and many of them may be very relevant perspectives. Uh, and it's important for the leader to take that additional effort to influence, inspire people and get them aligned. Uh, and many times I keep telling my teams that teams which are aligned deliver at least 30 to 40% better customer outcomes than teams which aren't as well aligned. Uh, and at times I have told teams when there is a senior leader who's not aligned uh, and it doesn't make sense if you make an effort and he still feels he has a different perspective. Respectfully 
it's the best option for both to look at different ways because there's no point in a leader being physically present and not emotionally aligned to the purpose because uh, that just creates greater dissonance for the organization now so i think it's the leader's fundamental responsibility to create that alignment to influence align and get people aligned to the purpose so this question is rather warranted and if you look at the theme of the conference also it talks about metamorphosis and the future of work changing as we speak right so let me ask you this question how is leading with purpose as a behavior as a leadership behavior evolving in the hybrid work model see i think it's become more challenging because to be very honest i think in our traditional work environment uh, there's nothing which you can substitute with a face to face because right not only are you communicating and being active listeners uh, you are also sensing body language you are able to sense the mood of the person how they react which to be honest in the hybrid world is not that easy to do uh, so right. to that extent i certainly believe leading with purpose in a hybrid world is becoming more critical because i think the ability to sense what is going on in the minds of people becomes a little more difficult than what you would have had uh, in the normal environment uh, which is why in the organizational context it's important to create more role models who are then managing this change in a more effective manner uh, are you reaching out on a no agenda basis uh, because at the end of the day there are newer concerns and questions which may be there in people's mind in a hybrid environment and it's not just the hybrid environment i think the workforce or teams will also move to a nature of engagement where you'll have mobile workers within your team what i mean by mobile workers is unlike the traditional environment where everybody contracts to be an employee of the company you're going to have people who'll say you know what i'm just interested in this work i'll come and work with the team for a couple of months and then move on how do you create alignment and purpose with them so i think in the new change world hybrid environment is a challenge teams being amorphous is also a challenge and leadership has to consciously address some of this by enabling what i would call no agenda touch points to sense and really respond in a more effective manner thank you for that response uh, so i come from the world of learning specifically leadership learning and i take care of strategy governance and purpose of course right uh, for for my organization now this question sounds like a catch 22 but i want to see how you think through this um it is said that passion often goes hand in hand with purpose right does passion and purpose i mean do they fuel each other or is one an outcome of the other see i would think without purpose it's very difficult to have passion no because you can't at the end of the day for some time you can feign passion but it cannot be something which really needs to in a way come very naturally so i would think the core is really purpose if you have purpose and you continue to sort of enjoy how do you try and influence people to align to the purpose passion really becomes an outcome of that the and to that extent the great advantage of passion is it's almost like it spreads to others uh, it's such a positive uh, that it is a very integral part of trying to make other people believe in the idea of leading with purpose uh, it creates a tremendous positive energy within the organization 
Absolutely. Thank you so much, KK. I have one more question that I'm going to hold on to till the end. I see the questions are pouring in. I'm going to ask the audience to post your questions on the right hand side. You have the Q&A button. You can push the button and ask your question there. I'm going to pick one question from there. Right. This uh, question comes from Deepak, who asks, what do we do when organization purpose and self-purpose is conflicting? See, I must be honest. Uh, I think there would be environments where your self-purpose is not aligned to the organizational purpose. Uh, right. While I think there could be a short time period when this misalignment can be there, uh, it doesn't help the organization or the individual that your purpose is not aligned with the organization. No. And in a very respectful manner, I think if these are not aligned, it's best to move on both for the organization and for the individual because maybe where you will thrive and really create new landmarks would be in a very different environment where there is alignment. I personally would not advocate saying, hey, can I try and influence an organization purpose or shall I change my purpose to be aligned with the organization? Because at the end of the day, all of us are individuals. We come with our own perspectives. Yes, we'll make some adjustments, uh, but they are not permanent. True. So you, you spoke about mobile workers in the past or gig workers, if you were to look at it. We are also moving into a future of work where there's a multi-generational workforce, hmm. right? And here's a very interesting question by Amit, who asks, sir, what would you suggest to new age leaders operating in multi-generational models, right? And uh, with multi-generational teams to drive purpose and engage the workforce to produce results. What, is, what are your two cents on that? No, that's again a very interesting question. Interestingly, in the industry in which I worked, uh, at one point in time, we had probably five generations of people becoming a part of the workforce. Uh, right. And I think we must be uh, realistic to the thing that the current generation is probably far more informed, have their own opinions, uh, and to that extent, the ability to sort of drive purpose in them is very different from what you'd have adopted earlier. Right. So the first thing is in terms of very intense inclusivity, because I think they're far more informed. Uh, be sensitive in terms of what is important for them. Uh, clearly, the newer generation is far more sensitive about the environment, far more sensitive towards sustainability. Yeah. And to that extent, it's important to bring in what they believe is important in the context of the organization purpose. Even if it's not been there, how do you start inculcating some of those thoughts? Because organizations are again not uh, something which is uh, frozen. It is also an evolving mechanism. And to in a way, get in the alignment of multi-generational workforce. It's important to understand what is important for them. Is it relevant in the context of the organization? And if it's relevant, in a way, include those as a part of your purpose. Uh, interestingly, at Mindtree, we had several of these experiences. In fact, when we started, we never used to think about sustainability. But as we started getting a multi-generation workforce, as we started getting the feedback, yeah, we really started thinking about it in a far more structured manner to the extent it led us to start publishing what are we doing on sustainability, which then becomes a scorecard in terms of what you're doing. Right. We never had what is called individual social responsibilities. Uh, it was only an organizational CSR. As we started seeing younger generations more sensitive. As a part of their KRAs, one of the KRAs was, what is your individual social responsibility? What is it you want to do? And how can the organization help you achieve on that? Right, right. So now that you brought a mind tree 
and your experience there. We have a pointed question uh, around that, which is, what is your success mantra at Mindtree and how much time does it take for you to achieve your purpose with Mindtree as an organization? See, the second question is probably easier. I think you cannot count it in terms of time. Right. Uh, I spent 20 years in Mindtree. Would I think, did we achieve that uh, purpose? No, we probably were in the right direction, but a lot more to be done on that. Uh, one of the essential tenets in Mindtree was that we just felt that Ordinary people can achieve extraordinary results if they're driven by purpose. Uh, and to that extent, in a way, we were, I would say, a large lab of how you could help people deliver their best potential. Lab. And to that extent, it was almost, I would say, a human performance lab where we were constantly experimenting and saying that, what works, what does not work. Yeah. Right. So I think achieving is always uh, a matter of how you see it. Uh, I would think I would rate ourselves maybe on a scale of 10 at 5 in a 20 year time span to a right. really where we wanted to get to. Right, right. So here's a question and uh, you spoke about the CSR initiatives and how there's purpose around that as well. Do Fortune 500 companies still continue to inspire businesses to make a difference to humanity? Do organizations like that see purpose in the community externally? I think that's where the question is going. Let me read that question again to you, which is, do Fortune 500 companies still continue to inspire businesses to make a difference in humanity, difference to humanity? See, I must be honest, uh, if, uh, if I had to substitute the Fortune 500 companies with large companies, uh, right. I think there's a mixed result on that. Well, there are some initiatives of theirs which are driven by purpose, uh, but a large amount of thing is, I would almost say, driven by the need to be compliant. Uh, like if you had to just take the... Uh, Indian large company examples. Uh, I have to do a 2% spend in CSR. So these are the five projects which I'll fund. And uh, sometimes uh, being the chairperson of a large foundation, which does this for member companies, I must be honest, at this point of the time, there's almost a rush to say 31st March, we have to exhaust our budget. So do something. <laughs> So I wouldn't say all their initiatives are driven by purpose. Uh, right. On the other hand, again, I'm sorry for getting back to the mind tree example again. Now, some of our initiatives are certainly driven by purpose. One of the key things uh, which we saw was that in the Indian context, the whole uh, work of what you call rack pickers was not something which people appreciated and even gave any time. So we said this is something which we need to change, partly because we were just amazed at the data which we saw, where the average lifespan for a rack picker, male was 32 and women was 28 or something. Yeah. And they just earned pittance. So we said with technology and giving them respect, we can change this world. Uh, so we set about building a technology platform by which we created a marketplace for waste. Uh, then we started forming cooperatives. We funded so that they have an electric vehicle to go around, collect the waste. And we ran that, what we call the platform is called I Got Garbage. Uh, we ran it in 42 different towns and municipalities where on an average, the earnings of the rack pickers increased three times just because we enabled technology through a marketplace where they could earn more for their produce and we got corporates to come in and buy there. Again, this is something where CSR was done with the purpose of ensuring that we improve the life of rack pickers. 
And we used to call them waste management professionals. We, in <laughs> my opinion, we used to call them that. Very nifty title, I have to say. Right? Yeah. You spoke about individual purpose and you spoke about organizational purpose. So it seems like there is a question that we all need to ask, which is the purpose fit question, right? My purpose and my organization's purpose, right? Here's a question which talks about culture fit. Okay, and the question reads, looking for culture fit candidates uh, is still relevant when we are looking at uh, things from a DEI scope from a DEI lens, is it still relevant? The concept of culture fit and, uh, or are we moving to purpose fit? What is your take on that? Uh, sir, the way I understood this, is culture fit still relevant in the context of organizations? Is that? Uh, that is correct, yes. Yeah. Especially from a DEI lens. Uh, see, I, uh, I would think I always believed in the idea that culture fit is very important because uh, at the end of the day, if you think in terms of organizations becoming entities which are sustainable and continue to allow people to grow both as professionals and individuals at the same time are doing good to the society, it is important to have people who have idea differences but cannot have value differences so, so it's very important to have cultural fit and to be honest i think it's very difficult to establish a very accurate assessment of in the process of an interview as to who fits culturally well and not uh, but one of the key things i keep telling my startups and companies whom i mentor is that Yes, there will be mistakes that you'll make. But if there is a culture misfit, uh, I think it's best to, in a way, part gracefully at an early time because these are not try and bridge. Yeah. Because even for the individual, they come from a perspective. And to that extent, it's important to appreciate that. Here's a question by Dr. Deepak Deshpande, who says, while passion is rooted in the heart, purpose is driven by mind, the head. How does one make sure they are aligned? More often, heart takes over the head, right? So how does one make sure that there is alignment between heart and mind there? See, I don't think there's an easy answer for that. Uh, because it is like your left and right brain thinking. Uh, sure. To a large extent, I think there will be times when you'll make mistakes where either the heart takes over the head or vice versa. But it's important to acknowledge when probably, yes, you have erred on one side. Uh, and it's a continuous balance which each one of us need to be playing. Uh, here's, I'm going to take one last question. We've been issued our 20 minutes. Uh, we have we've been issued our warning time. Okay. So I'm going to take one last question here, which is how to be fluid, especially within a startup ecosystem with the trials of new processes, how to be effective as a leader there? See, I think the role of leadership and leadership walking the talk is absolutely important in a startup. Because uh, honestly, the quote unquote product market fit many times is not clear. Uh, you're constantly experimenting with what is working for the customer, what is not working. And in a way, as you're going at probably 100 kilometer speed, you're changing the wheel. Uh, at those times, it's very important for leadership to walk the talk. Yeah. What that means is, yes, I think if you've done something which in terms of an offering doesn't really fit in to the customer, yeah. it's important to acknowledge that, yes, it will have implication in terms of revenue. You'll have pressure from your investors saying, oh, my God, what's happened to the revenue and so on. But the team sees it as a very important thing. When you make the right choice of saying, you know what, I think 
the organizational purpose is to do what is right for the customer. Yes, short term it impacts us in terms of revenue, in terms of reputation, but still the customer will respect us if we go back and say, you know what, this is what we sold you. We don't think it's right. We'll probably sort of not uh, do this for you and maybe even lose revenue in the context. Uh, so in a startup, it's very important to have a very transparent way of looking yourself into the mirror. Wow. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, here's one last question. Uh, I'm just going to look at the unanswered questions. We have a bunch here. I'm just making sure that we get we get to all the questions here. At least one. Ah, this is a good one here. It says, is it possible to be passionate but not aware of the purpose clearly and yet be successful? No, I think it's certainly possible. Because in a way, I think purpose is something where you need to get convinced saying, yes, I think this is what really is something which drives me. Right. And there's nothing wrong in terms of experimenting, understanding, what is it that really drives you? And being in that mode of experimentation and getting to what really drives you. And passion only will drive you towards having the energy to go through those experiments and continue to know yourself, get a better understanding in terms of what drives you. So it is certainly possible. So I'm going to ask you one question here. I want to believe that understanding purpose is a journey, right? Mm -hmm. If you look at your own understanding of purpose, your purpose, and the organizations that you worked with, right? How has that journey of purpose evolved? And how did that sort of attribute to the kind of leader that you are today? See, I must be honest. In the early stage, I think it happens over different phases of your career. Uh, I think in the early stage, like I shared earlier in the discussion, you get influenced by strong role models who you feel are leading with purpose. So that sort of stays with you. Uh, as you sort of start transitioning into more leadership roles, uh, the responsibility of how are you inspiring your team? How are you helping them grow? I think that really starts driving your sense of purpose. Uh, and as you sort of get into, I would say, the experience I had in terms of learning a uh, leading mind tree, I think the purpose in terms of what are you contributing to the society? In a way, that was the genesis in terms of this whole intervention for the waste management professionals. Uh, two, I must say, at this stage of my career, when I run an early stage fund, my focus is all on entrepreneurs. I clearly say the focus is not on us as investors. The focus is on the entrepreneurs. How are we helping them build great organizations? Uh, how are we being, I would say, more a great partner for them to build great organizations? And in our own way, how are we giving back to society? I think those are some of the things which drive you. So here's a question, and I'm thinking they are asking the question from a very purpose lens, mm -hmm. right? And the question read, reads, will technology overtake humans? And I'm thinking human beings have the ability to craft purpose. Right. And I think the person's intention behind the question is what happens when technology overtakes humans and what happens to the whole narrative of purpose? See, I would, I must be honest, I, uh, a lot of what I do now is really investing in what I call deep technologies, which is artificial intelligence, machine learning, and so on. Right. While there is this theory that Machines can replace uh, humans. Uh, I completely believe that's not possible because at okay. the end of the day, the ability to make judgments, the ability to distinguish and 
make more calibrated decisions is a very human uh, sort of phenomenon now you cannot build ai models to replicate human touch in everything yeah right. i think technology is clearly an opportunity to make people's life easier simple thing none of us visit a physical branch now yeah. we don't go and stand in queues to get cash from tellers uh, it makes our life easier but clearly the ability to make a judgment between two op- options uh, while you can model them i think a human intervention cannot be wished away so my thesis on this is humans can never be replaced by technology technology is always an enabler makes your life easier makes you more productive so here's a question again this is purely because i come from the world of learning do you think leading with purpose should be a part of academic curriculum when folks are in university mm-hmm. or do you think it should be part of experiential learning when they join organizations what is your take on that say i must be honest i do have a thing that these are areas where you can make significant impact on individuals uh, and again i come from a point of view that in our academic institutions we probably do not have the experience and the depth of people to really influence people and help them go on the path of leading with purpose this is very much an experiential learning and i think even leaders who can teach it in organizations are also learning themselves so i think while people may be exposed to this in an academic environment in terms of saying hey these are different things which you need to look for in an organization the ability to help people navigate that path is far more fertile in an organization where there is experiential learning right right here's this is our last question okay from the audience and then i will ask you my question that i parked which is how can leaders be empathetic towards their teams and exploit technology to fulfill organizational purpose or organizational goals how can leaders be empathetic towards their teams and exploit technology to fulfill organizational purpose or goals so one i think it's a very necessary criteria for leadership of the future to be empathetic and also be humble to their teams because i do think the role of humility is not being adequately emphasized because uh, i think we are in an environment where lot many times i think it's the teams which really teaches how to help the whole team move along the purpose which is set for well technology instantly is a good enabler and i think it's up to individuals to see how they leverage the power of technology like i'll give you a very simple example as head of hr in wipro it is a fast growing uh, thing because the whole technology uh, strength in wipro is growing dramatically so i took on this thing of saying that hey i need to know people by their names and maybe some personal details about them uh, and i just started training myself for that uh, but i used to do a little bit of what i call cheat sheets also outlook as a facility where you can record a lot of stuff about people uh, their wife's name their kids what do they do and so on so whenever i used to meet people one on one i used to be very familiar with all of that people used to think i remember all of that but the reality was i was using technology and bringing in that sense of a personal touch where people feel they treated as people sure thank you for that this is my last question what is brilliant about interactions like this okay especially you know the platform that nhrdn gave us with this particular national conference uh, is 
it allows HR professionals from different walks of lives to come at this intersection, right? And it allows us to understand and unpack complex topics and concepts like the one that, you know, the two of us have been discussing for roughly the last 15 minutes, which is leading with purpose, right? If I were to ask you to sort of give this audience three pieces of wisdom, yes, three takeaways that you think are essentials for any HR professional when they're leading with purpose, what would those three things look like? See, one, I would think the whole idea of leading with purpose comes from the top. Uh, so as HR professionals, people should feel comfortable to be a, a sounding board to the CEO to help him navigate the journey of leading with purpose. Because many times when I talk to CEOs, they feel very lonely about it. And if HR professionals can take the role of being a sounding board, I think it will help them in transition of the journey. The second thing which I would certainly uh, seek of HR professionals uh, is to, in a way, educate the leadership team on the criticality of leading with purpose. Uh, because leading with purpose is not the responsibility of the CEO and the HR team alone. I think the leadership has to walk the talk. Uh, and hence, it's important that the leadership team, probably the reporters of CEO, walk the talk. And that's how the organization starts believing in the whole idea. The third one is that all of this, while the organizations would lead for purpose, it's the larger purpose of saying, hey, we are here to create an organization which is memorable, which is admired. And this is really a tool to achieve that. So how do you get the larger organization into building something which they are proud of, which is where every individual will get associated with that and start believing and contributing to that. So I would think if HR professionals can start influencing three of these aspects, it would certainly help them in their journey. Fantastic. I think that's the best way to close this conversation. Number one, if you are an HR professional, be a sounding board. Yes. Listen to understand, don't listen to respond. Number two, educate on leading with purpose. Invest on educating people, the people within the organization on leading with purpose. And of course, how can we as HR professionals influence to get the larger organization to get on board on that common purpose, right? KK, it has been an absolute pleasure and a privilege to have this rather very textured conversation with you. Super, super insightful. You've given me plenty to reflect on and think about. Thank you so, so much for being a part of the conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sophia. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank, Thank you so much. You. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Krishna Kumar Natarajan, for exemplifying how purpose-led companies can do great things and how to integrate multiple purposes towards a core goal as businesses scale up. Thank you, Sophia, for the joy energy, positivity, and knowledge creation you brought through this discussion. Thank you, participants, for engaging the way you, you have been consistently doing since morning. Lots and lots of interesting questions from your side. NHRDN thanks you all once again. Thank you. Thank you. You take care. Have a good day. Bye-bye. As we come to the end of this session, NHRDN wants to thank all the leaders who joined us today and shared their, their laser, sharp, laser sharp insights. We extend gratitude to our extremely conversant moderators who made the virtual sessions come real and alive. We thank the attendees from both the corporate and student community who took time from their busy schedules to dive deep 
into this ocean of learning we brought to you today on day one of the 24th annual national conference. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow with the theme mega at 9 a.m. sharp. Lots of interesting sessions lined up for you over the next three days. Do share your comments and insights on social media with the hashtag, hashtag NHRDNC22. I repeat, hashtag NHRDNC22. Last but not the least, NHRDN would like to thank our sponsors for helping up put up this show together for the larger purpose. We would like to thank our strategic partners, platinum sponsor ONGC, silver sponsors Zozo Day, JSW, and White Crow Research, associate sponsors ICICI Bank, Indian Oil, NTPC, Mahindra Rise, World at Work India, and Bama Lorry Cooperative Limited, knowledge partner Mercer, and communication and design partner Fulki. Thank you all. Have a great evening.